Um, the speaker is going to speak English. Optimistic uh, um, statement. Uh, as you know, the, maybe you heard that the atom, uh, atomic scientists, but in 2016, you know, they issued what they called the doomsday clock. And in 2016, they said that we were at three minutes before midnight, meaning that we are on the verge of the extinction of the human spe uh, species. And they, the clock, they, they, they work the clock according to the dangers, and the main danger that today uh, human uh, beings are, and the human species is uh, facing, there are two, nuclear war and climate change. Well, nuclear war, we have a, a way to stop it. It's a miracle that nothing happened, and hopefully nothing will happen. Climate change it's, is much more dangerous, because climate change, if there is a point of non-return where we will have nothing to do. So we have to preempt. We have to start doing things. And if you, we look at what's happening, at what has been happening in the few, uh, and the, 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 um, uh, the information that we got recently from, uh, uh, the, um, from many uh, centers of science, we have seen that, uh, for instance, the National Snow and uh, Ice uh, Data Center for the Arctic uh, said uh, a few months ago that there was less ice than be ever before. And the mean temperature was, in 2017, was 23 degrees above normal. Gulf of Mex Mexico, the sea surface has never gone be uh, below 72 degrees. And it, has, it was the warmest winter in all the cities around the Gulf of Mexico. So, it's dangerous, very dangerous. And uh, I believe that what happened in Paris is that people, countries, governments, and also non-state actors reached that conclusion and decided to sign finally the Paris Agreement after 21 years of negotiations. We in Morocco, we decided, we believe that this the danger is, for the world is real. And under the leadership of King Mohammed VI, who has always been very highly concerned by the need to protect the environment since, since he led the Moroccan delegation to the Rio conference in 1992, um, we have been doing a lot. For instance, if we look at the renewable energy, well, by 2020, normally, by 2020, 42 percent of our energy will come from renewable energy. And we, I looked at the numbers, and probably it will be 46 percent. By 2030, it will be, 20, it will be 52 percent coming from renewables. So this is what we're doing, and, and we have, of course, a very ambitious NDC um, that will cost around $50 billion. Uh, among which half of it is conditional and half of it is not conditional. That's only for mitigation. That's only for mitigation, uh, but for adaptation, it's another $30 billion. So we're doing things here in Morocco in terms of environment, protection of environment, and also on mitigation and also on ad adaptation. There is a second thing that we have done, is host COPs two COPs, COP7 in 2001 and COP22 last year. COP7 was a historic uh, um, uh, COP because it was a breakthrough for the implementation because we set at COP7 the um, rule book for the Kyoto Protocol. And COP22 was also a very important COP because it was the first one after the Paris Agreement Meaning that we had Paris Agreement, we, it, we took 21 years to uh, implement, uh, to, to sign an agreement. But COP22 was the first COP starting to implement the agreement. So it was, uh, 
historic also because it was immediately after the, um, let's say, the, the entry into force of, COP, of the Paris Agreement. We had the first CMA, the CMA, which is the conference of the parties um, acting as a meeting of the parties to oversee the implementation of the Paris Agreement. And we had the first one in Marrakesh. By the way, COP22 entered into force less than one year after the, its, its, its signing, which is absolutely unbelievable. It's the first time in terms of uh, uh, for uh, an international uh, agreement. If we look again, if we look again about what's going on in terms of climate, we had a, a report uh, from the the, um, uh, the PNUE saying that by um, if we keep only the NDCs, all the NDCs together, we'll, we'll reach only by 2030 only one third of the objectives um, of two degrees. And on the carbon budget by 2030, uh, if we continue the way we're continuing, we will have consumed already 80% of, uh, of what we can consume to um, reach uh, uh, the objective of two degrees by uh, the end of the century. And by 2030, if we want to reach 1.5 degree, by 2030, if we continue to um, act as we are acting, we will have already consumed absolutely everything. So for the time being, we don't have, uh, let's say, very good uh, perspectives, but things are happening. So let me talk about COP22. The Moroccan presidency had some objectives. One of them was to keep the integrity of the Paris Agreement. You know, when you sign, when countries sign an agreement at the four o'clock in the morning, very often they don't know, I mean, people have been negotiating and negotiating and they don't know exactly what they <laughs> agreed upon. So it was the difficulty was to make sure that nobody was going to reopen negotiations. And that was my goal as chief negotiator for COP22 and the goal of the Moroccan presidency. The second was to start to work on the um, uh, modalities, rules and procedures to implement the Paris Agreement. That must, I must say that it worked because we worked pretty hard and we came out with 35 decisions, 35 important decisions. Also, we wanted to keep the mobilization of everybody. And this was the Moroccan Action Proclamation for our Climate and Sustainable Development. All the heads of states, governments, heads of delegation signed the proclamation saying that they are willing to continue to stay mobilized to address the problems of climate change. And, which is also very important, because COP22 was the first COP that had a second pillar, which was the pillar of the non-state actors that became, that we call the action agenda that started in Lima, continued in Paris, but at, at COP22 in Marrakech became a real part of the COPs. And today, every next COP will have the action of non-state actors will be crucial and absolutely uh, fundamental. So what, are, uh, what were the priorities of the Moroccan presidency during this, not only uh, towards COP22, but also during 2017? One of the most important uh, action was on, fi on climate finance. Cl why climate finance? Well, because if you look at the NDCs, a lot of the NDCs are conditioned. Uh, condition. Not all the countries have the means to implement their NDCs. So we have to talk about finance. Where is the finance coming from? Where will all these projects will be financed in terms of mitigation, but also in terms of adaptation? Well, it's a main issue. Of course, we had the $100 billion uh, roadmap that was announced by the developed countries uh, at COP22, but $100 billion is nothing. It's a drop, a drop in the bucket because we're talking about trillions. So the big, um, question is, where is the money coming? Where will be the, the money coming from? Um, 
of course it will be public money, but public money will never be enough. And the idea is to how we can leverage private money to implement the NDCs. We had what we call the, the uh, CAPE, which is an initiative that was launched by uh, Morocco and the World Bank. It's a, a meeting between stakeholders and, and especially ministers of finance to exchange uh, um, information and see how they can, we can work together to implement the Paris Agreement. There is an initiative, also a very important initiative, that was launched in, uh, in Marrakech, was the NDC partnership. What is the NDC partnership? And I believe that it is one, probably, uh, the, one of the most important uh, um, outcomes of COP22. What is the NDC partnership? Basically, a platform that um, will help countries to implement their NDCs. A country like Morocco or a country like uh, Bina, we have here, Mr. <laughs> Sensu, uh, or a country needs to implement its NDC. How, are going to, uh, how is this country going to finance the NDC? By, of course, using the uh, domestic finance, but it has to raise um, finance and money from other, um, uh, other sources. And the NDC partnership is meant to help countries see where the money is. And also, when you talk about finance, you talk about um, how you about capacity building, how you build the governance, how you build um, uh, the environment so that you can attract the finance, not only the public one, but also and especially the private finance. And when we talk about private finance, uh, I will quote uh, Cristiano Figueres, who used to say that there are trillions, four, five trillions, I don't remember the number, um, uh, invested at below zero interest rate. All the trillions are waiting for opportunities to have a better um, return on investment. And probably uh, on climate, and especially for instance today on renewable energy, there are big opportunities and it's happening. We had another other uh, initiatives, the Marrakesh Partnership to foster, to foster green capital markets in Africa, the Green Growth Infrastructure Facility for Africa, the Network of Financial Centers for Sustainability That's, uh, that was by, launched by Casablanca Finance City, the MBA for Climate uh, the, launched by CGM, which is the Association of uh, uh, Companies of Enterprises here in Morocco, and the Climate Finance Accelerator that we uh, launched together with the United Kingdom. We also worked on the adaptation, and we had uh, two uh, events on the metric of adaptation, because everybody's talking about adaptation, but it's not really clear, clear how you measure the needs on adaptation. And this is why we had an event in September 2016 and another one in October 2017 about the metrics of adaptation. And it was really interesting events. We launched the AAA, which is the adaptation uh, of agriculture in Africa. And we have encouraged the progress of uh, the uh, NAPS, which, is, which are the national adaptation plans. We also and that was also a, part, a very important part, part of um, COP22 was the mobilization and work with the non-state actors and the NGOs. The way I conducted and uh, we conducted the negotiations was to meet with the NGOs who are doing, you know, the CAMs and others who, are, who work only on climate and have their views and try to figure out how their views can be uh, translated in uh, the negotiations between the, uh, the, the governments. So I, I would sit with them, listen to them, share what their ideas with the, with the, the governments and have the return uh, from the governments and have, at the end of the day, an outcome that is not exactly what they wanted because they want the maximum, but um, pretty interesting uh, uh, outcomes. Cooperation, South-South Cooperation also. We had an event in New York, and uh, we are having another event in Bonn. And um, so many things have happened. Again, integrity of the Paris Agreement, st 
starting to work on what we call the work program, which means uh, procedures, um, uh, um, rules and, uh, and uh, modalities for the implementation of the Paris Agreement. And the other pillar, which is the non-state actors action. Now, we're going to COP23. And I think, what are we looking at COP23? Continue the, the work program. You know, by, uh, in, 20, um, in, in, uh, at the, in Paris, uh, we had decided that um, the Paris Agreement would enter into force. Everybody thought that the Paris Agreement was going to enter into force by 2020, and that the rule book of the work program would be finished by 2020. Well, actually, the uh, Paris Agreement entered into force in 2016, and now we have decided, the countries have decided, that the work program, rules, modalities, and procedures will be finished by 2018. So we will be working hard uh, in Bonn uh, in the next 15 days, and we will continue working during the year, especially at the session uh, in Bonn uh, in May and in, uh, in uh, Poland in 20, uh, 2018, in November 2018. There is also uh, a very important event that is going to happen in 2018 in, um, in Poland, which is what we call the, we used to call the uh, facilitative dialogue, and today it's called the Talano dialogue. Talano meaning um, conversation uh, between parties in Fiji. And what is this um, Talanoa dialogue? Is uh, countries sitting together and saying, trying to figure out where we are, where we want to be, and how we can get there. And there will, have, there will be a process that will start, that has already, that will start now in Bonn and continue during the Fijian presidency, and uh, we will have the facilitative dialogue, the Talanoa dialogue in uh, Poland at COP24. Um, so, the, 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 go, the, um, the objectives, uh, the priorities of the Fijian um, uh, presidency, uh, as it was said, it was advanced at pre-COP in Fiji last week, was, is to advance the work of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change and preserve the multilateral consensus, to uphold and advance the Paris Agreement, uh, to build greater resilience, uh, resilience for all vulnerable nations, to forge a grand coalition to accelerate climate action before 2020, and beyond between civil society, the scientific community, the private sector, and all levels of government, including cities and regions, and um, to harness innovation, to draw a strong link between the, the health of the world's oceans and seas, to infuse COP23 with the Fijian Bula spirit of inclusiveness, friendliness, and solidarity, and promote the Pacific concept of Talanoa. So, I started with a very pessimistic uh, statement. I will uh, be a little bit more optimistic. Why uh, am I optimistic? Because I. What I have seen is that there is a real uh, will by everybody, governments, uh, non-state actors, many, uh, I mean, uh, especially companies that are decided to do whatever uh, is needed to be done. Um, last year, uh, you know that the, the, um, uh, President Obama issued the Clean Power Act and uh, the um, it, it, the, uh, the coal producers sued that act at the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court said, well, they have some reasons, uh, they have uh, some ground. And uh, cities, states, uh, companies, the association, the Edison Association, which is the, the Association Institute, which is the association of the power producers in uh, in, um, in the United States said, well, the Supreme Court can say whatever they want to say. We have our program. We're doing what we have to do, and we will do it. So there is a mobilization by everybody, by companies, by states, by cities. And you can see that in the United States when you go everywhere, you can see how much things are happening. California, Texas, and every, and, but also in other countries, here in Morocco, and everywhere else. We can see that countries have decided to go into energy efficiency. 
And energy efficiency, and you, if you look at what, uh, what, ha what has happened in China, it's amazing. We had a, a report uh, showing that there was a dramatic drop on emissions, but also a, a growth on uh, jobs. Energy efficiency is, as, is so important that it re represents uh, the um, consumption of Japan in terms of energy. So that, and everybody's working on energy efficiency. Then, the last um, but not least, if you look at all the decisions taken by many countries, and especially China, for instance, but also Norway and other countries, that have decided that mobility will be electric by in the next 10 years. Norway, by 2020, all the cars will be electric. China, by 2025, all the cars will, 25% of, the, of um, the, the cars will be electric. And this will mean a lot. And other and other countries that we can see uh, a lot happening in terms of research, in terms of uh, um, science, in terms of transforming science into implementation. And we can see that, and this is my word of optimism to end this uh, statement and this intervention. And thank you very much. And I'm sorry to keep, keep you, to have kept you without eating for such a long time. We are going to take two or three questions uh, quickly, but I will put the first one myself. As a diplomat, what, what have you learned in this uh, climate negotiation process? Because it is an unprecedented uh, way of uh, diplomacy, uh, uh, since it is really, for the first time of uh, human history, uh, global. So, and of course, in terms of uh, international law and the like, uh, there is all the discussion about the nature of the agreements, uh, soft law, uh, uh, real law or not, and so forth and so on. Well, first of all, what I've learned is that it's terribly complicated, terribly complicated. It, and uh, these negotiators have been negotiating, the same negotiators, many of them have been negotiating for 20 years. So, you know, only the acronym, it took, took me Casablanca, Washington, Washington, Beijing, Washington, Beijing, uh, Casablanca to learn the acronym. So it's very complicated and the concepts and the topics are really, really complicated. At the point that the head negotiators, um, you know, the chief negotiators, uh, have their own experts for each item. So it's really complicated because it has implications implications on the economy of, of the countries, implications on what's happening. So it's a, it's a very difficult uh, process, and it was very difficult, and I must say that it's amazing that we reached an agreement in, um, in Paris. So. <laughs> in a nutshell, okay. Well, thank you very much. Je peux prendre donc, euh, alors, Denis Badré. Hein? Bertrand, oui, ça, ça. Je confonds toujours le père et le fils. Il ne, il ne, il ne me manque que le Saint-Esprit. Bon. Et j'ai vu une autre main là, qui Voilà, vous serez le suivant. Alors, Bertrand. Mr. Ambassador, thank you very much for, for your words and congratulations for Morocco for the role you played in maintaining the integrity of the Paris Agreement. Uh, I'm not a diplomat, I'm a man of finance, and I know that everything we discuss will cost money. And you rightly said, I mean, public money available is in the billions and needs are in the trillions. At the same time, we all wonder why you have so much money left with zero rate all over the world. The main issue is how can we, it's not going to happen overnight that this money we say, oh, climate change is a great opportunity, we move there. It's not happening. So how can we push decisively beyond the, I would say, the circles of diplomats and politicians to really, in the next I would say, two, three, four, five cops, in that way, how can we really change the financial system so that they naturally come there? Thank you very much, Mr. Ambassador. Okay. Um, I will answer uh, this question. It's easy. Private finance is not there for philanthropy. Private finance is <laughs> there to make money. So it's basically, and how do you make money? By creating the conditions so that private money will make money. 
Um, but you can see already, uh, so you have to create the conditions, the environment, the regulations. First of all, to make sure that uh, who's investing knows where he's investing and what will happen to his money in 5, 10, 20 years. That's one thing. So, and this is, we had our first meeting of the scientific committee for the COP22 here in Morocco, and it was very interesting because each, you know, the renewable energy people, the agriculture people, the water people, each one was saying, well, we did this, we created this regulation, we raised this, this money, we created this capacity building, and at the end, for three hours, I said, well, we have here good examples uh, to attract, how to attract money, because most of the the projects that have been financed were financed by public money, some by public money, but a lot by private money. Let me give you an example. I have a friend who set a fund, a renewable energy fund in Senegal. And she uh, has already raised something like $100 million. And, and the return on investment will be 16%. So it can work, and especially because today, uh, let's say the cost of the um, of production of renewable energy is going down, 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 each time lower and lower. For instance, uh, I heard that the Saudis are uh, investing, uh, are creating a farm where the, um, uh, the cost of the kilowatt will be 1.7, I think, cent for the kilowatt, which is amazing. So I think that it's about Countries creating the regulations, the, need, the, 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 the real regulations, so investors can come, and, um, and little bit by little seeing that uh, it's, a, it's a good business. Look, if you, if you go to California, if you go to Texas, Texas, 10 years ago, they didn't have one uh, wind farm. Today, it's the number one in the United States in terms of wind energy. And why people are investing, why countries are investing, why uh, companies are investing, because there is a good return on investment. So creating conditions. Third and last. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Ambassador. Tatsu Master from Japan. I'm teaching at NBA school on energy and climate change. And you, what you talked about is really thrilling to me. And also I have one boy, student, who came just from, back from Japan, who I taught, and he'll be working on climate change. One question to you. You talked about the importance of non-state actors. I do agree with you. And there is many initiatives from non-state actors like Breakthrough Energy Coalition and others, but if there is any, any area missing uh, from non-state actors, which would be the most critical areas you'd like to see those initiatives taking place? Thank you. Is it a question or a statement? Where is the question exactly? There, there are many initiatives taken from non-state actors, like uh, Breakthrough Energy Coalition. Yes. This is technology. But if there is any areas those initiatives are missing uh, from your point of view, which would be the area of that are missing. where you like to see more non-state actors' role to play? Well, everything that has to do, all the companies, for instance, uh, most of the companies, uh, many companies, of the biggest companies in France, have um, a, um, a carbon price, for instance. Internal carbon pricing. Now, nobody agrees for the time being on the carbon pricing and international carbon pricing, but it's happening. It's happening internally in companies, but it's happening also between, for instance, the state of California and some states in Canada. So I see more cooperation and cooperation between uh, companies, states, uh, cities in this, and working to the, together to lower the emissions of, uh, of carbon. CO2 or equivalent CO2. Thank you. 